بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وشفيعنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to all of our viewers who are watching live and those who are going to be watching this later إن شاء الله welcome to another edition of the Karima Live um, and Alhamdulillah, we're very honored to have two incredible guests and maybe more if uh, things work themselves out, inshallah ta'ala, um, talking about an incredible man. Uh, may Allah ta'ala's mercy be upon him, the Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani, rahimahullah ta'ala. And I guess this is a continuation of a series I want to now begin because a few weeks ago we had a program commemorating Murabid Haddamin with two of his students, Sheikh Rami Ansur and Sheikh Hamza Wal-Maqbul. And I was just thinking, you know, about this consistent refrain that we know of, the, the fact that one of the signs, and Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani, what's amazing is that he was a master of the signs of the end of times. And one of the signs of the end of times is Qabdul Ulama, the taking of the scholars. And I, I don't know if you ever considered that maybe he would be one of the signs, eventually, his passing, the loss that we feel from his going. And it was only after he passed that I began to look into who this man was, and it was just mind-blowing. The, the work he did and, and, and the mindset he had and, and, and the revival project. And these are all different things that we're going to be talking about with our guests, inshallah ta'ala. And I think one of the great things about the two uh, guests we have is they're going to give us a picture like, you know, you think about the Prophet Sallallahu you know, there's so many different aspects of his life that you can you can attach yourself to. And I think that Habib had this gift as well. From what I've seen or heard or read about him, you know, like he, he loved to paint. I just found that so remarkable as an idea that one such a great scholar, he loved to recite Qasaid and he was a great scholar of the tradition as well. And he had this um, idea of a project. He had a project in mind. And I think this is something that I, I want all of us to always recognize with the loss of scholars is that even with their passing, they have khulafa. That, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said That this knowledge will be carried Every single generation Allah Ta'ala will have people who will carry the tradition And even if the carriers leave There will be those who will follow them Who will pick up where they left off And our hope with these conversations Is to instill that sense of hope And to bring people forth That will inshallah Ta'ala take the tradition That these great, great luminaries have left us And then we can pick up from where they left Inshallah Ta'ala following in their footsteps. What I want to start with, inshallah, before I start to guess, is just a recitation from the Qur'an. And I chose these verses, and I think they are very pertinent to the passing of the Habib. Um, and so I will recite the Qur'an myself today, inshallah ta'ala. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَاعِيلِ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ رَبَّنَا وَاجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ومن يرغب عن ملة إبراهيم إلا من سفه نفسه ولقد, ولقد اصطفيناه في الدنيا وإنه في الآخرة لمن الصالحين إذ قال له ربه أسلم قال أسلمت لرب العالمين ووصى بها إبراهيم بنيه ويعقوب يا بني إن الله اصطفى لكم الدين فلا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أم كنتم شهداء إذ حضر يعقوب الموت 
إذ قال لبنيه ما تعبدون من بعدي قالوا نعبد إلهك وإله آبائك إبراهيم وإسماعيل وإسحاق إبراهيم وإسماعيل وإسحاق إلها واحدا ونحن له مسلمون تلك أمة قد خلت لها ما كسبت ولكم ما كسبتم ولا تسألون عما كانوا يعملون صدق الله العظيم and I'm hoping that we can get some reflection on these verses. But for me, what I felt was very powerful about this, these verses is this is a, a discussion of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, who is one of the grandfathers of Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani, because he is Ahlul Bayt and from the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it's just a reflection on the Millah of Ibrahim. And, and it gives us an idea of the tradition that he was continuing. That, that was the, the tradition of the prophets and it was the tradition of our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the verses themselves finish with the passing of Sayyiduna Ya'qub alayhi salam when he says to his sons who will you worship after me and they say we will worship your lord and the lord of your forefathers Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq this idea of continuing the tradition and the last verse is that was a nation that passed they attained what they attained and you will attain what you attain and you will not be asked about what they did and so a reflection that we have work to do, even if the Habib is no longer with us. Rahimahullah ta'ala. I want to quickly introduce our two guests. So we're joined today, alhamdulillah. I'll start with our Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmed Sa'ad al-Azhari, um, who d doesn't need much of an introduction, but the Sheikh spent nearly 20 years of his life studying at the, the, the venerable institution that is Azhar Sharif, the great university in Egypt. Um, and he has attained ijazat. He's a master of the Quran in the recitation, is ijazat in tajweed. And I'm hoping he didn't take too many mistakes out in my recitation that I did. But also, <laughs> the Sheikh has mastered many of the ulum Islamiyah. He teaches, he has an institute, I think it's called Ihsan Institute, that brothers can look up and sisters and, and see if they want to study with the Sheikh, who, who, is, a, who is a very strong, mashallah, scholar. Uh, but and at the same time, he's, he's, he's in academia. He's currently doing his PhD on the topic of the Habib Abu Bakr Adani and his engagement with modernity. And I think we're going to have an incredible discussion with regards to that as we move forward. And also with us, inshallah, we have Ustad. He told me not to call him Ustad, but I, I can't help it. Ustad Adam Kelwick, who is uh, who spent time with the Habib um, and has a very close, good personal relationship and will give us some personal reflections on his time with him and who also um, currently works as a chaplain in the blessed land of Liverpool, Sharif, which hosts one of the, if not the greatest football club in the history of mankind. I had to make that comment. I do apologize to the viewers if you don't like football. But alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to both of you, inshallah. How are you both today? Alhamdulillah. I will ask the viewers if you could share the link and, and get as many people watching as you can possibly do. And also, as we go through the program, if you have any questions, just put them in the comments and inshallah, I'll try to pick up as many questions as I can from the viewers who are watching the program as well, inshallah. I think I, maybe I want to start with uh, maybe um, a, one question to both of you, and I'll maybe start with Sheikh Ahmed Saad just because of his seniority. Um, would you mind maybe just sharing with us your own relationship with the Habib? I mean, when did you meet him? How did you get to know him? Your first interactions with him? And then maybe some personal reflections on your own relationship with the Habib, inshallah ta'ala. Sheikh Ahmed Saad. <laughs> وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وبارك على سيدنا وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين تبرأت من حولي وقوتي إلى حول الله تعالى وقوتي فإنه لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم I have come to uh, to know Habib Abu Bakr uh, in a stage in my life where uh, there was a lot of questions that I had even though that was not a very early stage of my life but it was a time when my thought about تصوف uh, was shaken by some incidents that happened in Egypt um, and some alignments that some scholars have made with uh, governments. And uh, I personally found that to be colliding and clashing with uh, a lot of messages and principles that I have learned from the same shuyukh of tasawwuf for a long time. 
and I could not resolve this uh, conflict. So um, I, I, I kind of like wear, wear many hats on a personal level. So I write poetry sometimes. I do a lot of things. And I found that there is a there was a connection between me and Habiba Bakr at that at, in that in that in that sense. So it all happened through a third person who was uh, Sheikh Awn Al Qadumi, who's a good friend of mine, and he uh, he was a long uh, long time student of Habib Abu Bakr, and um, at that time he he sent me a PDF copy of Al Khwaisa magazine, which Habib used to produce, <clears throat> and I sent some lines of poetry. Uh, based on what I have read uh, to uh, Sheikh Oon and asked him if he can deliver that on my behalf to Habib. And, uh, and Habib wrote back in poetry, which uh, he actually published it in Khuwaisa. And, and then uh, Sheikh Oon uh, took a photo of that and sent it to me. Then in 2014, uh, while I was in Hajj, uh, I got in touch with uh, Sidi Muhammad uh, Raid Abdul Al, who used to be a khad one of the khadims of Habib. And I asked if I can meet and I did actually go of visit Habib, and uh, we had we had a we had a, a very good meeting. And then the meeting it all started from there. The meeting started in in Jeddah, in his place in Hayr uh, Ragama, and then uh, then in Singapore. The following year, he was in Singapore, and uh, uh, there was a joint activity. There was like a talk that Habib was giving, and I was speaking at that time as well. And, and what I said, even though I did not at the time wasn't familiar with fiqh al-tahawulat uh, at, at a depth, um, um, the speech that I gave uh, Sayyid Ahmad al-Mashur, Habib's brother, uh, was translating to him what I was saying. And then afterwards he, uh, he said to me, uh, you, it seems that you, you think in the same way. Yeah, that, that what you're saying has a... Because I was talking, I remember I was talking about the... The, the Iblisi mentality as opposed to the 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 Adami mentality and uh, like in very very generic terms of course not nothing 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 as consistent or as structured as what Habib himself had and then then when the question on time came uh, he asked if I can be the translator the next day he invited me to his hotel uh, and he asked if I can re uh, translate the Nubda and it all started from there uh, then uh, I translate. I went back, translated the Nubda, uh, asked uh, Sidi Amjad Tarsin to to review it, and then uh, got published. And uh, I made I made sure that every time I go to, uh, I obviously I read the Nubda with Habib in Singapore. <clears throat> and uh, every time I would go to Jeddah, whether for Hajj or Umrah, I would uh, be be there. And that that's at least twice a year. I would call Habib after the Umrah or after the Hajj, and he would. He would ask Sidi Ra'id to book me a flat uh, right next to him, and I would go and spend a few good days with him. And that's basically like daily, daily meeting with him. And uh, I kept communicating with him on WhatsApp, so I, I was regularly communicating with him. There was a level of spiritual connection as well that I had with him, which I will prefer to keep to myself. Um, but but that was a, a very serious, uh, uh, seriously close close relationship. Um, my communication, and, and I've, I, I used to visit him, as I said, in Jeddah, mainly in Jeddah. And uh, the last visit I, I, I saw him in was in Paris. He was here for some, uh, do, doing some medical checkups in February 2020, 2020, 9th of February 2020, right at the beginning of COVID. And uh, then he left, and then he left to Yemen, as a lot of people know. And, um, and then communication continued until July 2021. When Habib Habib's response response became a little bit slower because I think of ill health and I came to know that he was he was not he was not very very well. But going back to that that beginning of the the relationship, there were points in this relationship where that uh, I would say this kind of panic feeling about what's going on with the Mashaykh of Tasawuf used to come back to me at certain points. One of the most vivid points and I'll. Uh, I'll be very uh, open and honest, regardless of what uh, what the consequences might be. Was when uh, the, the the conference in Chechnya happened a few years ago. If if anyone recalls, and I was very disturbed by that. I remember it just happened before Hajj, and I went, and uh, we used to go to Medina before we go to Mecca. So I I happened to sit behind the uh, the door of a Sayyidah Fatima, uh, radiyallahu taala anha, uh, just before uh, Fajr. 
and uh, I wrote a qasida, a complaint to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I remember Habib has a qasida called it min babi Fatim bint al-Mustafa ati ila nabi li yaqdi kulla hajati. And that, that, that was very vivid in my mind. So after, after, after Medina, we, when we went to Mecca, I happened to meet Habib in, in a house in Baqa Quraysh. And I asked him about the whole situation and he gave me an answer that resolved a lot of, a lot of issues. Uh, and his answer was very interesting. He said, many of the ulama of our time, they don't lack righteousness. They're righteous. They don't lack the knowledge, but they might lack awareness. They don't have the proper awareness of how damaging it might be to come close to politicians. They might do it with the good intentions, but uh, the Prophet ﷺ was always on the side of the masakeen. It is safer, he said, with all its problems, it is safer to be on the side of, the side of the laity that, rather than to be on the other side. <clears throat> and he acknowledged that the awam have their problems as well. But he, he noted that the Prophet ﷺ was always on the side of the laity. Yeah. So that's... Uh, that, yeah. yeah. So at, at one point as well in, in, in these years, a lot of things happened. I, I joined Fiqh al-Tahawlat Diploma uh, with Habib. It was basically a way of, of kind of like uh, organizing the students who read Fiqh al-Tahawlat with him. And uh, uh, I was inspired to look into his project and start writing about that in academia. That's, that's what led to my, to my PhD. Yeah. And, and just before I move to start Adam and ask him the same question, inshallah, as an opening question, just to clarify with the, this, this, this con conference that happened in Chechnya was an attempt to demarcate what Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah was. And there was a large portion of the Muslim community that was ostracized and said that they were no longer considered to be from Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. This was the Grozny conference, I assume you're talking about, Sheikh. Okay, very interesting. And the Nubda Sagira, I think that's the book you translate, the concise article, which is a summarized form of his Fiqh al-Tahawulat. And, and I mean, before I move to Ustad Adam, can I just ask, what is Fiqh al-Tahawulat? Because this is the great project of the Imam, and maybe we'll touch on it in more detail later, but just to just define the term before we move on, so, inshallah. So, so, so Habib's, uh, Habib's writings are unfortunately underrated and again you know it's it's good opportunity to say that the nubda is 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 a is a is not a proper representation of what this man has actually said and did because there is a lot of works that are not familiar with people there is a suquf al munhara al idah wal ishara lima asab al umma min hazaim al suquf al munhara there is al mustashriqun wal tanwiriyun orientalists and and uh, illuminati and tadafur uh, mubham fi fi asr al ghatha al mushtarak like a ambiguous co collaboration at the at the time of uh, worthlessness, and there is a lot of other books on uh, Maqalat Paris, like Paris articles, and so on and so forth, that talk, that show you the Habib as a proper thinker and someone who engages with ideas that that are very related to the West. But Habib has always believed that uh, uh, that uh, that it is it is a role of the faith to preserve the articles of the faith. It's the role of the faith to preserve the articles of the faith. And in order to preserve that, the, 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 the Ummah has to be aware of the changes and the challenges that will face it throughout its, throughout its life. And that the Prophet Sallallahu summed up these challenges, not in detail, but in two statements that are in Hadith Jibreel. One of them represents the change that will happen in, in politics, and in economy, and the other represents the challenge and the, the changes that will happen in terms of ilm and i'tiqad. These two challenges that will face the, the Muslim community will impact their deen, will impact their understanding of what knowledge is, uh, will impact their uh, ostracizing of the unseen, not believing in the unseen, and so, so on and so forth. So Fiqh al-Tahawlat was basically a project to preserve the diana of people, the deen of people, at times when the challenges uh, are so immense and people, and, 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 and uh, the ulum al-thawabit or the Islam, iman and ihsan are no more enough because they focus on the individual, but they are not enough to make the individual immune, immune against the, the, the waves of challenges. That's why he would call it sometimes understanding changes and transitions traditions, fiqh al-tahawulat, sometimes he would call it fiqh al-tahseen, 
the fiqh of protection, shielding the Muslim individual. How can he? He calls it fiqh al-hasanat sometimes. Hasanat, having the, these kind of hasana. And the hasana here refers to the ummah, but the hasana takes different shapes. When there was a khilafah, for example, before the, the Ottoman khilafah has collapsed, there was a hasana. And part of this kind of immunity the ummah had was a, a unified entity called the khilafah. With the collapse of that, the hasana has disappeared, but there is hasana at a different level. Now, with all of these shukuk, all of these doubts with the ulama and people of religion and so on and so forth, there is a breaking of the hasana idea so that people become so individuated, so fragmented, they listen to their own selves, and that will only help and assist the Dajjalic uh, kind of wave that is coming and preparing people mentally and emotionally and spiritually for, for the appearance of the Dajjal. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Ahmed Saad, and, 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 and we're going to come back to this topic, I think, soon, very soon, inshallah, and, and, and elaborate on further details. Um, Ustad Adam, I mean, here's uh, we your own relationship with the, I mean, we had some private chat just before this and you were speaking about your own personal relationship with the Habib. I mean, the first time you met him and, and your interactions with him and any personal reflections you have on your own time that you spent in his company. Alhamdulillah. In the name of Allah, all praise is due for Allah. May his peace and his blessings be upon his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, every now and then uh, Allah blesses you to spend time in the company of people who remind you of what you read about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you when you open up the book of, of the Shema'il, for example, the, 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 the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you see many, many different examples of, of this. And Al-Habib Abu Bakr, uh, in my experience, was one such person who combined so many of the Shema'il of the Prophet Wasallam. whether it was in the way he, he used to talk, whether it was in the way he used to walk, whether it was in the way that he used to love and care for people, uh, not just people from, from his school and his group, but actually his care and his concern uh, was, was extended to, to everybody uh, around him, and, and so my my first my first experience with uh, with uh, Habib Abu Bakr uh, was uh, I think almost twenty years ago, uh, and it was in the city of Aden in Yemen, and I'd met up with uh, a friend of mine who I travelled together with on the Hajj. So my first Hajj, I perform I performed it from. Uh, from Yemen, uh, and one of the the tent mates, if you like, one of the people who was with us on this on this Hajj group was uh, a, a student of the Salafi school of the school of uh, Sheikh Muqbal uh, Al Wadi in uh, Damaj. Uh, but he was a lovely person, very very. He, he was uh, he was a bit of a comedian, so uh, so he was light hearted and. But I remember he introduced me to some of his friends in one of the areas of Aden called Sheikh Uthman. And at that particular time, when I went to visit him after not seeing him for a few years, I remember I was wearing the imam and wearing the turban. And when we were together, when he introduced me to some of his friends, some of his friends seemed quite disturbed that I was wearing a turban. And uh, one of his friends asked him, he said to him, why is he wearing a turban? <laughs> And the response of my, my friend was, did you not know that Sheikh Muqbal used to wear a turban? <laughs> that was the response. Regardless of whether Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear a turban or not. But that was the response. So it was quite an interesting interaction. But, but where, where this is going is, within that conversation, within that conversation, it was mentioned that there's a particular masjid here in Aden. And there are some graves in this masjid, which the people worship. And not only do they worship in these graves, they go and they do tawaf and they do all these kinds of different things which are against Islam. And so this is what the discussion, this is the path it was it was leading towards. I think maybe they were trying to save me from deviation or some, something like this. And they were using that as an example. This was their way of, of uh, being wise in, in advising me against uh, the company of certain people. 
and they warned me to keep away from Masjid al Aydarus in, in Aden, in, in the original city of, of, of Aden. We were in a different part of the city. And I said to them, you know, are you sure that's what the people there are doing? They said, yeah. And on, on, on Laylatul Jumu'ah, Thursday night, they gather together and they jump up and down and they do all these crazy kinds of uh, gatherings. And, and I said, well, it's Thursday night. It's Thursday now. It was after Asr. The sun is about to go down. Why don't we go together and we'll give them some advice for the sake of Allah to leave the shirk what they're doing and to not continue upon this path of falsehood. To which they said, no, 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 no. I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go. And I want I want to see this for myself because this has always been my, my approach since I was uh, younger. You know, when people say, stay away from those, stay away from those, stay away. It, it's been in my nature. As soon as somebody says, stay away from those because they do this, this and this. I like to go and check things out for myself because it's not always accurate what people say about each other. Uh, and so I, I took the, you know, the minibus, which packs itself with 12 different people. And I went to this other part of the city. I went to Masjid Al-Aydarus. And lo and behold, there was a big banner outside Masjid Al-Aydarus. And it said uh, that there's currently a course which is being uh, led by Habib Abu Bakr Al-Mashur. Uh, which is Tasheeh al Mafahim al Khati'a and Ziyarat al Qubur. <laughs> SubhanAllah. It was rectifying the wrong uh, uh, understandings towards visiting graves. And I went into the masjid and I saw Al Habib Abu Bakr al Adani and he was there and he was educating his congregation how to perform a visit to the graveyard or to visit the graves in a way which is according to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so this was my first experience. It was uh, after hearing these negative things which were spoken about the sheikh, about the masjid, about the, the community, and then going there and discovering something completely uh, different. And, and from then, alhamdulillah, over the years, I've it, it's been actually quite strange, quite strange, because a lot of the time, uh, it wasn't planned, but we just happened. I just happened to find myself in the company of Al Habib Abu Bakr when we did the ziyarah to Al Janad. Al Janad. This is an area of Taiz where Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu anhu founded the masjid there, and uh, Habib Abu Bakr would used to, used to uh, be there for the yearly uh, kind of anniversary uh, of of Al Janad. There was a big uh, there was a big event which used to happen on a yearly basis, and then I'd find myself with Habib Abu Bakr attending a wedding in Sanaa. I find my alhamdulillah, and so over the years, this this kind of uh, link grew. Uh, and what if there's one word or one theme with the interactions? Uh, I would have to say they were fatherly. They were fatherly, and I'm not the only person who's experienced this. Every one of the the students, the followers, the lovers of Al Habib Abu Bakr, when we received the news that he passed. It was very heavy, and everybody felt that that they had lost, they lost a father. And the reason for that was not only did he promote this this fatherly school, which has its origins, like you correctly started with, you know, talking about the milla of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam and its continuation through the prophets of the descendants of Ibrahim to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam until Yom al Qiyamah. But it wasn't just theory for Habib Abu Bakr. It wasn't just academia in books. You could feel it. You could feel he cared for you. He loved you. He would encourage you. He'd smile, this mo the most beautiful smile of, of, of the smile what a, a proud father gives to his son. And he'd be concerned and he'd be worried and he'd be upset about the same things which a, a worried and a concerned father would, would have towards his son. And he genuinely saw people as his sons and his daughters in this ummah and this is another characteristic which he shared with the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam this concern azizun alayhi ma anittum you know the, the 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 afflictions which had affected the muslim ummah and not only that but the afflictions which rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave us the ability to shield ourselves with which will come in the future these were things which were very heavy upon Al Habib Abu Bakr to the point where he devoted his whole life to this, to to helping and trying to protect, if that makes sense, and and save people. And and the main way which 
he did this was through this field of fiqh tahawulat. Now, I remember when I first heard of this concept, fiqh tahawulat, well, what does that mean? I know fiqh tahara, I know, I know, I, I know, what, what does it mean? And I remember asking another of the mashayikh in Adin, Sheikh Muhammad al Najjar, who was also somebody who was very close to uh, uh, Habib Abu Bakr al Adini, what, 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 what is fiqh tahawulat? And he was explaining to me, it's, it's fiqh of tahawulat. And I'm like, okay, so it's understand what what, what tahawulat? What are these tahawulat? These changes? And it was it was a very difficult concept for me to grasp in the beginning. Until over the years, it was it was slowly broken down. And in general, for anybody out there who's wondering, what is this fiqh tahawulat? So the way that Habib Abu Bakr used to explain it, very very simply, uh, as as our, our dear Sheikh uh, Ahmed Saad mentioned before. So he says, if you go to any university, any Islamic university in the world today, you will find that the sciences go back to three sources, three pillars of the deen. The sciences of Islam, which are fiqh and sharia, they have their principles, they have their usul, they have their rulings, the, the, the science is developed. You will be, all they will go back to the science of iman. So Islam, iman or ihsan. Iman, which is the study of aqidah, study of tawheed. Once again, we have schools, we have principles, we have these rulings applied to it. It's it's a it's a very matured and developed school uh, or, or, or curriculum, if you like, with all these sciences leading back to it. And then there's the science of ihsan, which some people call tasawwuf, other people call tazkiyat uh, and nafs. Once again, you have them leading back to that. So we have Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. But when Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam left the gathering of the Sahaba and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to him, do you know who the questioner was? Umar. And he replies, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, verily it was Jibreel. He came to teach you the affairs of your deen. In other words, if we want to understand the deen, everything is summarized through the questions of Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam who appeared in the form of a, of a, 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 a handsome man which he asked to the Prophet Sallallahu and the responses of the Prophet Sallallahu summarized the deen. But it didn't just stop at Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, because he also asked, when is the hour to which the Prophet Sallallahu said, the one being questioned knows no more than the questioner. And then Jibreel asked, okay, so, so tell me about its signs. And then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that you will you will see the, the, the slave girl give birth to her daughter, uh, the, the slave girl give birth to her mistress, and you will see the barefoot destitute uh, shepherds vying with each other to build the tall buildings. And so what Habib Abu Bakr is saying, we have the sciences of Islam, we have the sciences of Iman, we have the sciences of Ihsan, but what about Halamat al -Sa'a? And if we're entering into the Akhir zaman when the signs of the hour are now transforming from the smaller signs, which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, into the medium and the bigger signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah, the first of, the, of the, the large signs is the appearance of the Mahdi. If we're at that period and we still haven't understood the science of Alama Tasa'a, then as an Ummah, with this tradition and this inheritance, which the Messenger ﷺ left for us, we're at a huge loss. And so what Habib Abu Bakr did was devote his life into unraveling and, and taking this, uh, this uh, how do you say it in, in English, kham, taking this, uh, this uh, raw, uh, raw science of, of alamat al sa'a of understanding the signs of the coming hour and making the foundations, making the principles and, and formulating them in a way in which we can access the shield which was given to us, left left to us by Harisun Alaikum Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and a shield which is going to be very, very important for the times which we are in now and the times which will be coming until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And Jazallah Khair and Ummat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Khair al -jaza. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala give our, our, our beloved Sheikh, our Habib uh, Abu Bakr Al-Adani, the best of rewards for this service which he, he gave for us. And, and I, I remember I used to be thinking while, while he was with us and he was giving us these gems and giving us, you know, access to these, these uh, very valuable treasures. I remember thinking as this was going on, I, I, I don't think people will realize 
the importance of what he's giving to us until after he's passed away. And unfortunately, it seems like like this was uh, this was the way it's going to be. But Alhamdulillah, inshallah, as, as you mentioned, there are people, there are Mashaikh like Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmed Sa Sa'ad, there are Mashaikh like Sheikh Ahmed Al Kaf, there are Mashaikh like Sheikh Muhammad Mbai, who are around, who've studied, who were given the ijazat now to continue these uh, the, the, this science and, and allow people to, to engage with this. And one thing Habib Abu Bakr used to uh, ask for me often. Uh, and so I feel like I'm, I'm, I have a responsibility on my shoulders, which this event today will give me a means to unload that, that, that weight, inshallah. He used to always tell me to encourage people, especially from the West, to consider studying in the colleges and the institutes, institutions which he founded, which are all across Yemen. In fact, people used to laugh at Habib Abu Bakr because what he was doing was building these huge buildings all over Yemen, these huge institutions, these colleges, all over Yemen, and, and, and people were saying, why is he building these huge buildings? They're heavy. Who's going to fill these buildings? But this was a man who through his connection to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and through connection to what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophesied, because don't forget, a Nabi, linguistically, comes from the one who, you <laughs> know, the one who gives us, who prophesies us, who gives us access to things which will come. And this was from the mu'jizat of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the vision of Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani is that these buildings which he was building will be filled. They will be filled. And inshallah, uh, I, I'd like to encourage anybody who's serious about delving more, who you might have mastered the sciences of Islam and Iman and of Ihsan, but we're in times now which this, this science of alamat al -sa which we can call now fiqh tahawulat is very, very, very important for the future of not just the Muslim community here in the West, which is very, very important for, but the Muslim ummah all across the world. Not just the Muslim ummah, for the whole of humanity. This was the concern of Habib Abu Bakr, for the whole of humanity. And he would often talk about, you know, this, 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 uh, this uh, cardinal or this original war which started the war of Iblis against Bani Adam. And it's mentioned in the Quran in, in, in very, very clearly. But the first people, the first people who were separated into two camps were the sons of Adam, alayhi salam, Habil and Qabil. And Habib Abu Bakr used to always encourage us to make sure that we're from the camp of Habil. Make sure we're from the camp of the awliya Allah and not from the camp of Qabil who was in the camp of awliya al-Shaytan. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can benefit from, from the legacy which is, has been left behind. So I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to divert there, but uh, I think sometimes just to simplify things, because this was another thing which Habib Abu Bakr was amazing at doing. He could not only speak to the scholars and the ulama in the language which they understood, but he had this beautiful, beautiful manner of being able to, to speak to the most simple of people. He could speak to simple people on the street. He would speak to tribes and, you know, really rough and ready people and understand with them. And not just understand them, he would be able to convince them very, very quickly that he was sincere and he really cared for them. And subhanAllah, so many people's hearts would be able to be transformed. Uh, and, and, and this is something which I, I've witnessed myself, you know, I don't want to go into the details, uh, but there was, there, there's a, a leading uh, somebody who's considered to be a leading uh, figure of a certain Islamic movement in the United States today. And I witnessed an interaction between Habib Abu Bakr and this individual. And mashallah, Habib Abu Bakr managed to completely transform the heart. And this is an individual who, as a default, would be opposed to the likes of the Habaib of uh, Sada al Alawi in Yemen and opposed to the Sufi menhaj in general and, you know, all, all these different things. But subhanAllah, this, this, this brother had his heart transformed. But why? It wasn't because Habib Abu Bakr was trying to prove to him that he was right and, and he was wrong. It was because he saw that Habib Abu Bakr had genuine love for him and genuine concern for him. And this, this love and this concern was... Ya Latif, Allah irhamu. Uh, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, inshallah, and, and maybe maybe our, our dear Sheikh uh, Ahmed Saad can, uh, 
you, you know what I'm saying about about the, the, the just the love that he showed. Subhanallah, this concern, Harisun alaykum, Subhanallah. Jazakallah khair, Ustad Adam. Um, that was an amazingly beautiful, deep, deep reflection on your own relationship with the Sheikh. And I think there's so many points that, that we can we can build on. I just wanted to, um, to, to not segue, but but just to take it back slightly. One of the things I was reading, um, and you mentioned about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and I think one of the descriptions of him in the tradition, riwayo ibn Ka'b. That the Prophet وسلم, in one riwayah is, 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 is the father of the Ummah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and in some hadith as well. And I guess in the sense of, you know, I mean, uh, Shaykh Ahmad Sa'ad himself, I think you're a Hassani Sayyid, mashallah, we're in the presence of Ahlul Bayt, the, the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, right now ourselves, and this is a great honor. Um, and the Habib takes from this tradition the Ba'lawi tradition, the tradition of the Habaib. And I was wondering, I mean, in terms of, I don't know if how I, you have as much time as you want to be honest, but his own tahawulat, his own journey, his own, you know, his upbringing, growing up in a family of, of Ahlul Bayt, his time, he, he left Yemen, why he leaves Yemen, what happens, what, because I think sometimes with the ulum, and I think, I mean, the Sheikh knows this better, is the idea that many of the ulama, they embodied the sciences that they studied, that they became, they were the science, they were the knowledge. And sometimes if you want to really understand the ulum Islamiyah, you just look at the scholars and they give you a great glimpse than the books they write and so i was wondering if you could share some reflections on his or sort of his biography where he grew up his upbringing and then the tahawulat he underwent himself and then maybe even i know he was very close to sheikh i think it was habib abdul qadir al saqaf and 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 where did he take this even the, the idea of the fiqh tahawulat i think he mentions it's it's all starts from faqil muqaddam who starts um the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa now it's time to understand the hour is upon us and so he actually took that from the tradition of his family so i was wondering if there was a way that we could inshallah build on on, on that as a point you know as they they, they say the, the, the there is no such a thing as a life lived in isolation so you can't separate the life of a person from their ideas and habib Bakr is, and that was one of the reasons why i chose to write about him even though that uh, essential idea has uh, developed from uh, just wanting to write about his project as a traditional Islam between radical extremism and radical secularism uh, to move to, uh, to his project as a traditional engagement with modernity. Uh, him being a candidate for uh, such writing came from a few things. One of them is that uh, Yemen is such a uh, a, a vibrant and uh, an interesting country that has always remained out, outside the radar of academic writings. And the forces of modernity were as active in Yemen as they were active elsewhere. But Yemen, unfortunately, hasn't enjoyed that much interest in writing about, the, about, about what has happened. But, but more importantly, Habib Abak uh, uh, lived uh, and witnessed a lot of changes himself. He, he, he was born in colonized Yemen, 1947. Uh, he was born in colonized Yemen. He had, had interaction with, uh, with, with European colonizers from the very, very early days. Uh, his father, Sayyid Ali, uh, migrated from Tarim and uh, stayed in Ahwar, and he opened a school there, Al Madrasa Al Maymuna. And uh, Habib grew up between the masjid and the school and the father. And in my biography chapter of him, I actually focus on these three. I said there, are, there is actually three forces in the life of Habib. But there was something that I thought about. Uh, he, he wrote his own biography in four books. Uh, the first is Rihlat al Hayabin al Waqa' wal Qawaqa', the journey of life between, uh, between reality and shells. Al Hafra al Jadal Dakra engraving on, on, the, on, the, on the walls of memory. And that covers his early years up until the. the, the, the the journey uh, which he had to take to run away from communist Yemen. Uh, his life was under threat. And he depicted a whole book on the, uh, for that called Al Khuruj Min Al Da'ir Al Hamra, leaving the Red Circle. And he had to, he had to leave Yemen, as, as, as you know, because of uh, communists. They, they, they blocked all the ways for him. And he lived in Saudi Arabia from 1980 till 1991. That's 11 years. Uh, and at that time, Salafism, basically, he's coming now to another challenge. 
So he had the challenge of col colonialism, then he had the challenge of communists, he had the challenge of Salafism, and he handled that in a very interesting way. He uh, and he had he had that close proximity to Habib Abdul Qadir Saqaf, and he took him as his as his uh, student. And uh, he actually he wanted to go to Azhar, as he mentions himself. He wanted to uh, go to Azhar, and his father didn't want him to go, be, uh, so he took him to Habib Abdul Qadir, and he said, "Stay with me, and you will get what you what you will get in Azhar." And then uh, when Yemen got the unification in 1991, he went back to Yemen and he started building, as uh, uh, Sidi uh, uh, has, has mentioned, Sidi Adam, as uh, he, he was building these buildings, these institutes, the Ribats, Marakaz al Tarbiya al Mihaniya, all of these uh, centers for teaching people how to go back to crafts uh, and how to go back to professions and how to go, to go back to uh, uh, sustainable activities that will give the society self-sufficiency as if the man is foreseeing that we were, that the world is going through a food is going to go through food crisis is going to go through a crisis of of resources how can people have stability through sustainability and that that was something that he always promoted and that he always, always spoke about but and, and and he he records his experience Saudiya, the 10 years in at tajrib al murra which traces his encounters and what exactly happened to him. And then he talks about uh, the, the post-unification Yemen and his life between Saudi and Yemen. But one of the most interesting things that, that always at, that attracted my, my attention is Habib starts his, uh, his first biography book by talking about um, that he was born and then he had another brother born right after that. And they were both uh, kind of... Uh, there was what happens between uh, between brothers, you know, like a bit of jealousy and this and that, to the mm -hmm. level that his brother actually uh, pushed him and closed the door on him. And there was a big pin that entered into the side of Habib. And, uh, and he takes it from there, goes on to talk about how his father got him a bike, a bicycle. And he used to ride this bicycle when he is not memorizing Quran at the break time. And I took that to talk, and, and he, he said something like, uh, his life became on the move. And, and that was actually a life on the move. He had a life that was on the move from that day on. He was always moving, right? He was in, in the middle of, of difficulties and the middle of illnesses and all of that. The man wouldn't talk about his illnesses, wouldn't talk about his uh, his own uh, his own problems and uh, i'm sure uh, sheikh adam would, would agree that he would he would give his attention and his love to the one who sits with him uh, that you forget to ask him about how he is and he will ask you about how you are uh, i i have a i have that personal uh, personal reflection uh, that i i would i would not forget that my three daughters were named by habib and he always came back to me when i whenever i take a picture of them as, as soon as they come out and send it to him and he would get back to me right away and uh, and, and he would reply with poetry uh, and spontaneously so it was it was a life that was that was very rich it's a life that is very rich it's very rich in the sense that he came, he had the experience with the european modernizing uh, uh, forces uh, the, the 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 british authorities visited al madrasa al maymuna where he studied and then he grew up to become a teacher and they liked what was offered but they had their own plans as well they had their own plans of modernizing the school and he could see that he could foresee that that now the abawi education the fatherly education is being threatened by the anawi the individualistic the egocentric the student centric education where he speaks about uh, the concept of المقبول, the contracted knowledge that is based on a contract between the teacher and the student or rather he, as he, he would prefer to call it the service provider and the customer the student becomes a customer and the teacher becomes a service provider and it's no more a teacher deciding or suggesting to the student what is good for the student it's the student demanding what they want to study so from that sense it's a contraction it's a contract between the student and the teacher. And it's, it's also contracted in the sense of uh, uh, sidelining all Islamic sciences. Anything that's to do with the ghaybiyat is uh, uh, mythological, is superstitional, it's not welcome anymore 
focusing on the employability of the people, of the individuals, rather than the, the qualification. Uh, uh, th there was, um, I can't remember, I possibly saw this today. Yes, he was talking about servable uh, education as opposed to uh, uh, the education that, uh, that gives you the, 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 the talent, that provides you talent, or what, what they call, for example, liberal, liberal sciences. You know, the liberal sciences, they enable you to think properly to do any type of job that you would like to do. But uh, degrees, specific degrees, they qualify you to do a mechanical job that you don't know anything outside, right? Uh, so he saw his uh, institute as something that's providing this, and then he saw that the, ch the changes that are in introduced to that are uh, waves of modernization. And then as soon as the colonizers left, uh, there was there was a big wave of Marxism, and he was asked. Uh, his father, first of all, was told that uh, he is no qualified to teach and to run the school because he doesn't have a degree. And he he mentions bitterly that how his father had to go on training to go to do some training, uh, and for the first time he he saw non hijabi ladies in his life, and he had to. They were laughing in their hearts about this uh, Muhammad, this uh, term man who sits in, 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 the, in, the, in the train. And then Habib Abakr himself was told, but in this case, he did not recluse. He did not go away. He actually went to Iqdadi, he studied Thanawi, he studied like, uh, like modern. He did the degree of, uh, of Tarbi. That's the, the I am not going to uh, I will disconnect from, from the, the time. He actually took the challenge to prove to people that traditional education is not uh, uh, is not disconnected from, from the reality. And he found in every step that there was a challenge for him and there was a, they were blocking the roads for him. He wanted to have a, a place in uh, in Aden, and he couldn't because every time he asks for a flat, they, they wouldn't give him. And when he finally got a flat and he was about to move to it, his first wife died, giving uh, just after giving birth. And uh, you can feel the sweet the the, the, the sweetness, but the sadness. He, um, I'll possibly later on quote something from how he talks about his wife specifically as he talks about his wife uh, and, 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 and that she used to share these uh, moments of life with him uh, where he, it was his, his, his life, right? And, and then he, had to, he, he found that he had to, to, to leave Yemen and go somewhere else. And uh, in Saudi Arabia, he, uh, he, has his, uh, he, he noticed a lot of things and he noted a lot of things uh, but he was very accommodative. You know, I remember there was a specific writer who belongs to uh, political Islam. And I found that Habib in one of his books quotes him. So I wrote to Habib, I, I noted that you quote so-and-so, and that -so and uh, he's known to be a, an Islamist. What do you think? He said to me, uh, objectivity in knowledge should allow you, should actually demand you to quote from people regardless of their ideological affiliations. And your focus should be what they say rather than who is saying it. And that was an important lesson in, uh, in objectivity, uh, which uh, throughout these years of knowing him, uh, and that was very significant to me, he had a different line of thinking, a different line of thinking, even from the other Ba'alawi Mashaykh. <laughs> which was interesting to me. And he always called this the way of the Salaf, which I believe it was, because uh, uh, as, 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 as people know, every school goes through changes and challenges as well, where certain generations might uh, see the reality in a different way and possibly it is better to change a little bit in the school. But Habib was, his, 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 his view on, Disengaging from politics uh, 
remaining remaining at um what, what do you call it at a kind of like a distance from that even his views on the west um, you you spoke about sheikh adam spoke about the west and the importance of, of of students in the west learning and studying at these schools i remember i had a conversation with him and he said to me that fiqh tahawulat would be more welcome and understood by western muslims more than uh, more than muslims in the middle east because they uh, face the challenges that i'm talking about so his his biography is quite an interesting biography because not only it, it talks about the, the 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 faces he went through uh, but it also talks about the uh, the that his life was centered around those three things the father the the school the masjid uh, one of the things he, he notes for example where he was talking about electricity and the arrival of electricity in Aden and in Ahwar and how the the masjid of the city of the of the city of Ahwar became lit by electricity but instead of people finding that a good thing and then they would go to Salatul Isha no they were glued to their screens <laughs> the, to TV and and the 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 the, 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 the he, and he said that this is how human beings are Allah gives them some form of uh, uh, technology to develop and then they take they they they, they lose the benefit of that technology and they start looking at, taking taking the the negative side and he said they are like the uh, the flies gathering around a bulb of light uh, <laughs> where they the the only thing they can see of it is is that uh, they, they, they they don't they don't understand that staying at a distance from that bulb of, of, of light will be the best thing for them and coming too close to it will burn them so it says human beings unfortunately do these things now and Allah, there's i think there's so much there's so much to pick up see i my own background recently in a couple of years ago alhamdulillah i completed a master's in economic history and then i read where the habib talks about the ribawi and the iqtisadi and i was just like subhanallah untouched there's so much there that we could just pick up and you talked about sustainable development which is like a whole that you could do degrees in sustainable development now which is just maybe i don't know I, i'm hoping that we can carry on the conversation and pick up on some of the economic thought of the habib because economics i think is something that many muslims are neglectful of and how powerful a force it is in, in shaping and a reflection I mean on the Islamist thing I think many people especially in certain traditional circles get very there's like an Islamist phobia they get very scared when they hear this idea that there's a political Islam I remember reading about one of the great scholars of the last century Sheikh Islam Mustafa Sabri rahmatullah alayhi, who was this great challenger to modernity and I read his biography and his daughter mentions that uh, one of my father's best friends who would come to our house very often and actually funded one of his major works was Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. And when you mention that to people who love the Sheikh, Sheikh al-Islam Mustafa Sabri, and he praises the writings of Sayyid Qutb, and he met him and he knew him. And I'm just like, Allah Alam, I don't know. I just think sometimes, you know, what you mentioned about the Habib, when I read him myself, it just blew my mind. I was like, he's very different. There's something unique about this personality that has he's taken hold of the tradition in an incredible way and understood that what it can give to the chaotic nature of modernity. Um, I don't know if uh, Ustad Adam, you want to come back on that. I do one one facet I do want to open up on is, and you mentioned this as well, Shah Masad, is his creativity in that he used to love to write poetry. He wrote many, many poems. He wrote Manzumat. He would write biographies in poetic form. He wrote a biography of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, which I read recently in poetic form about you know how great the Imam was. He used to paint. I still find that remarkable. I can't even imagine like a sheikh who paints. <laughs> he used to paint uh, landscapes. He used to paint things. Um, he used to recite qasaid. He loved, you know, one of the things he mentions, I read the biography, part, started reading the autobiography you sent, and he talks about as a young child, he learned how to recite qasaid, and he would, he would become like a munshid, and he used to love to recite poetry. Um, I was wondering, you know, before we go back to his more ideological stances and some of the more technical work, if we could touch both of you, inshallah, I don't know the creativity of the Sheikh. He's like this personality, this uniqueness in him, in all of the things and how he would reflect that, inshallah ta'ala. Maybe Ustad Adam can start and then Sheikh Masad can share something as well. Oh, sorry, you're muted, Sheikh. I'll just, there you go. Uh, I, I was just saying, I think it's amazing when you reflect upon the, the life of, of Habib Abu Bakr and, and how, how many fields he contributed towards. So, 
So his his uh, not only was his tajweed amazing, but his qira'a, just to hear his voice was so beautiful. And it, it, amazing, just the, the way he read Qur'an, the way he used to sing qasaid, uh, his voice, it, it was beautiful. And, and you know, everybody, whenever people attended the gatherings, especially in, in Saudi, uh, everybody would, would wait for when it was Habib Abu Bakr's turn to read uh, the, the chapter in the book because his, his voice was so beautiful. Uh, you mentioned before he, he was he, he was a poet. His, I used to be astonished at where these poems were coming from, and um, and the only the only way I can understand it is is one of the one of the shiuch from Morocco. He once tried to simplify for me understanding how Allah puts barakah in the time of certain people, how Allah puts barakah in their time, and and he said to me, "This is to simplify it for the for the likes of me and the level that I'm at." He said, have you ever seen the film, The Matrix? And the scene where the bullets are shot and everything slows down, except the people who are able to move away from it. He said, try and think about it that way. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts, gives, gives barakah to, to the awliya in their time, he stretches their time. And Al-Habib Abu Bakr is without any shadow of doubt, anybody who knew him. You know, there were times when, when I, would, I, I would be traveling with him, I'd be keeping his company. And during this time, I'd, you know, the next day I'd be with him for the whole day and the whole night. And then the day after somebody would visit him and he'd, he'd give them some poetry and he'd say, oh, oh I, I wrote this yesterday. And it's like, when, when did you have the time to write this, Habib? <laughs> you know, you were, you, were, you were teaching all day and you were, subhanAllah. So, so the, man had, the man had barakah in his time, mashallah, tabarakallah. And when it comes to the creative side, you mentioned before his, his artwork. Alhamdulillah, on one of the, the last times that I got to spend company with him, he gifted me one of these uh, pieces of, of, of art. And what I did when I got back here, I sent it to a, a friend of mine who's an art dealer. So this is somebody who's who sells your low rays and all, all the, the, the latest artists, you know, people who invest in art. For, for many people, it's a business investment. Uh, and he said to me, what is that? He said, who's the artist? <laughs> And I said he's he's a he's a in, an Islamic scholar from Yemen. He said what? Because apparently the style of this art as well is is, is you know it, it was respected from from people who know the world of art. Mashallah, tabarakallah. And that was just one of his pastimes. He'd he'd pick up his pens and he'd pick up his his paints and he'd just he just and he'd put many of the meanings of his works as well and and the sciences into these pieces of art and I think somebody's gathered some of them together online and you can you can look at them and and you could you could easily see them on the on the walls of of the the Tate Modern Art Gallery you know th these were subhanallah and then in, in addition to that like what you were saying before in terms of the economy he had a broad understanding of economics he had a broad understanding of of trade and business and and I used to take uh, he used to give me instruction in, in regards to the humanitarian work which I was doing in Yemen as well and what what he would be emphasizing on were the the latest trends in humanitarian work so he'd he'd talk about self sustainability long term sustainability he'd talk about things like the you know the 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 uh, reliance upon uh, on other on other countries and the danger of it when it comes to your 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 availability of food and uh, and subhanallah yani somebody who was who was a, a thinker and, and way way ahead of their times yet if the average person was to to bump into him in the street you'd just think oh that there's the imam the local imam you know he's a nice guy he's a religious guy and you wouldn't think that he had this command of, of of all all this knowledge and all these sciences and and once again we have another we have another one of the characteristics of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam the the humility and sometimes I look I look back at photographs which I which I've had together with Habib and, and I'm up here and and he's down there in physical stature but I get surprised because when you're with him again another one of the characteristics of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that even though he wasn't the tallest of the Sahaba when you're in his presence, wallahi, this man had Heba. He was a man who had this, this very powerful, uh, almost overwhelming presence. And you would never imagine him. To, I mean, mashallah, tabarakallah. Uh, once again, just, just the blessings of, of this, this individual. You mentioned before his, his connection to Habib Abdul Qadir, 
the Saqqaf. Now, Habib Abdul Qadir the Saqqaf was, was considered to be, for, for, for the Ba'alawis, he was considered to be the, the, the Qutub, the pole of, of his time. And uh, I don't think it was any coincidence that at the janazah of Habib Abdul Qadir, Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani was the one to, to take the lead on that. And I don't think it's it's unrealistic to to consider that Habib Abu Bakr was was from the main inheritors of Al Habib Abu Qadir, and what Habib Abu Bakr took after anybody who knew Habib Abu Bakr knew that after the passing of of Habib Abu Qadir, there was you know you talk about these transitions, there was a huge transition uh, which which occurred, uh, and Subhanallah. One one time, and and this this inshallah it, it, it can be shared. One time, uh, Habib uh, Abu Bakr he was he was explaining that when when the shiuch and here we're talking about spirituality and the spiritual knowledge or the spiritual gifts and openings which they have when they leave and when people inherit from them, the way in which this happens, the process in which happens is 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 a smooth way. It's something which is done gradually and over time because I didn't really understand, you know, about what, what does it mean when, when you know, we, we have these uh, narrations even of the Messenger Sallallahu which talk about uh, a certain type of, of awliya, the abdal, when one of them passes, he's replaced by another one and, and this kind of concept. And, and Habib Abu Bakr explained that when when the people leave the 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 hayat al dunyawiya to the hayat al barzakhiya is that what they do they 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 their their inheritance is given but it's in a way which is gentle and gradual and so subhanallah that there are still people now as we who as as we're speaking now who will still be receiving their inheritance from habib abu bakr after he's passed and this process will carry on and carry on and carry on uh, in, inshallah for, for, for generations to come uh, but I thought that was very very poignant uh, and back, back, just to bring it back now because maybe you want to take the, the, the discussion in, in, in a different direction what we were talking about you've got to understand the Adan so Habib Abu Bakr Al-Adani his laqab is Al-Adani the, the Adani guy the person from Adan and what you've got to understand in the context is Adan is this amazingly unique part of the world so even when it comes to the the prophetic narrations we have mentioned uh, several mentions of, of Aden as a city and there are even those who say that the Dukhan which is another one of the signs of the hour uh, will come from from Yemen it will come from Aden and in fact the oldest part of the city of Aden is known to this day as Aden Crater they call it Crater it's literally a volcano it's a dormant volcano it's a huge dormant volcano and Masjid al Aydarus who is Al Imam Abu Bakr Al Adani? He has the same name, Subhanallah. Imam Al Aydarus is buried there in Masjid Al Aydarus in this huge crater, and many people will say that 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 will be the place where the Dukhan, where the smoke comes from at the at the end of time. And it's you know we also have these mentions in the Hadith that when the Mahdi appears, that there will be uh, armies of supporters who will come from Aden Abian. And if you look at Aden on the map, and if you look at Abian on the map. And you look at Ahwar, which is the town where Habib Abu Bakr was born and he was brought up, basically. Yani that's, that's the area which has been talked about here. So this will be the home uh, and this will be the, 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 the starting point, if you like, from people who will give support to this imam who will bring justice in the world, inshallah. And much of the, the works of, of Habib Abu Bakr were talking about things in detail like like the appearance of, of the Mahdi, uh, and not just that, like the appearance of the Dajjal and warning people. And another thing, and I don't want to, to sorry, I, I don't want to digress too much, but there are some things which are very important. Habib Bakr, he used to say that because the Dajjal is a deceiver and he's Iblisi in his nature, he's from the he's from the awliya of shaitan, he takes the opposite approach. He's a false prophet. He's a false messiah, al-Masih, al-Masih al-Dajjal. So, and what Habib Abu Bakr used to teach was that in, in what happens with the appearance of a prophet is that the revelation and the sh sharia comes after the appearance of the prophet. However, with the Dajjal, you've got the Dajjaliya, you've got the Dajjalic system, which will not come after his appearance. It will actually come before his appearance because it's the opposite. And so what will happen is the Dajjalic period will, will come and is what we should be warned about. He says, when when you read in the Tahayyat, 
He says, look at this, even when you're seeking refuge with Allah, you're not even seeking refuge necessarily from the Dajjal as a person in his appearance. You're seeking refuge from the Shar of his fitna. And this fitna and the Shar of it will actually be a prelude to the appearance appearance of the Dajjal. And he's saying these are the times we're heading towards. And the Messenger Wasallam, all we have to do is go back to what he's left us. There are so many traditions, so many hadith, which give us the details of these events. And so he goes and he, he splits them up into times uh, and periods and gives them names, as were mentioned uh, by the Messenger of Allah, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what I was going back to saying about Aden is that it's a very unique place. But what you have to understand is when Habib Abu Bakr was being brought up there, it was a British protectorate, the city of Aden. And not only was it a British protectorate, if you speak to any old English sailor who used to be in the Merchant Navy or who visited Aden in that time, and you mention Aden, they call it Aden in English. Their faces will light up at the memories of Aden. For then it was the most modern, the most amazing, most developed place in, in the world that they could remember. Maybe similar to today from a Dunyui sense that we see Dubai and the kind of, the you know, the, the glitter and the glamour and all this. Aden or Aden, Back then, and this is this is the context in which Habib Abu Bakr was brought up. And even if you go back to Imam Al Aydrus uh, Al Adani, if you go back to him and see in his time, the Portuguese were there and they were colonizing Aden. And then after the Portuguese, you know, Aden is a very very special place, and the whole world has wanted a share in this part. And so it was a British protectorate after the Portuguese tried, the British tried, and then we have the, the you know the the Shu'iya. The socialism and the, the the red circle or the the communism and the, and the USSR, which had their interests there, and after that, you've got one civilization, quote unquote, civilization or movement after the next, who've wanted Aden uh, as as their gain, and so Aden is a city of tahawalat, constant tahawalat. Even to this day, if you go to the park in Tawahi, you'll see what they call the Little Ben. It's like a, a clock tower. It looks like Big Ben, but it's smaller to this day. It's still there. You'll see the church towers and the crucifixes on the churches, which were predominantly built by the British. And you'll also see, to this day, a huge bronze statue of Queen Victoria in the middle of the park there. Uh, and so it's a very interesting uh, place, Aden. Uh, even right now, it's going through another transition. It's going through another, another change. Uh, but what the people of Aden say is, whenever a fitna an international, a global fitna arrives in Aden, it's usually a glad tiding that it is coming to an end. So the British Empire, after they came to Aden, went into decline. The USSR, when they came to Aden, into decline. Before them, the Portuguese, they arrived in Aden, they went into decline. And look at the people playing around in Aden now. Maybe it's a sign that they will also be going into decline. And we ask Allah for salam and afi, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Um, I was wondering, somebody's asked actually if we can see a picture of the Habib's artwork. So maybe if you send it to me on WhatsApp, if you have any pictures, and I can send them to the admin team and they can try and put them up and I can I can actually show people on the banners uh, the artwork of the Habib. But that was immense reflection. I mean, I'm just thinking about the Ottomans. As far as I know, they never actually controlled Yemen in a in a very real sense. There was always uh, delegated control of Yemen. And so maybe that was a good thing for them because you just mentioned once you get to Aden, everything starts to go wrong. So it's better to let Aden take to, care to this of day, itself. To the, sorry, to this day, if you go to Turkey and you mention Yemen to them, they have this nasheed, they have this song. And it's crying and it's mourning over what they call the shuhada in Yemen. All the lives of the Turkish soldiers which were lost as they were trying to uh, uh, to, to, to take over Yemen. SubhanAllah. I've sent, that, uh, um, I've sent the, the piece of art to, to the group. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll quickly pass that on. Um, what I wanted to ask Shah Ahmed Saad uh, before maybe we move over to final reflections and we have um, our Munshid sing some of the Qasaid of, uh, we have Imam Al-Haddad, we don't have any writings of uh, Habib Abu Bakr Al-Adani to sing, but he used to love to sing the, the poetry of Imam Al-Haddad, so we'll, we're going to inshallah have that sung for us as well. Um, I wanted to ask um, one a remarkable thing um, I read from Shah Waliullah Dahlawi, who talks about the, the Khilafah, the, the notion of Khilafah, and he says Khilafah is of two types. There's Khilafah Zahira 
the visible caliphate, which is governance, which is law, which is judges, and that's that maintains the 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 the, the forward facing or the front facing uh, image of Islam. And then he says there's a thing called the khilafah batina. There's the hidden caliphate, which people can't see. And this is the ulama, this is the sufiya, this is the shuhada. These are the teachers of the tradition who maintain the tradition amongst the normal, the common people. And when you talk about Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani, I feel like he is Khalifa Batin. You know, this, this hidden caliph helping maintain this incredible religion of Islam in, its, in, in this private sense. And what I feel is, and I, I want some reflections on this, and I'm going to be very careful with my wording, is... A lot of people now, when they look at traditionalist Islam, whatever whatever that means, they're very uncomfortable with it because alliances have been made, hands have been shaken, um, things are happening, tahawulat are happening, and they see there's a complicitness. And you mentioned this yourself in terms of the Grozny conference um, in, in political terms. I mean, I don't want to, in, in, in as vague terms as maybe you could possibly reveal, you spoke about the Habib and his own reflection on politics. I don't know if there's anything you can possibly share with us about the, the political tahawulat and what the Habib's vision was with regards to what Muslims, and especially, especially, I mean, just recently, I saw, you know, Yasir, Sheikh Yasir Qadi, Dr. Shadi Al-Masri, political engagement. They did this big podcast. This is a big thing, especially with Muslims in the, in the West getting very nervous about the left, the right, prevent, CVE, alliances, politics. What is what is the mandate for the people of Islam, the ulama and the awam, in terms of the political tahawulat that we're seeing happen in front of our eyes at the moment from the works, from the life of Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani? Rahimahullah. Um, um, I, I, we uh, we talked about the this hadith uh, of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allahu marham khulafani. And written on the Is it me or Sheikh yeah. Ahmed's father crashed or? Yeah, is it back? Um, yeah, I can hear your voice. Your image is, is still slightly blurry. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Now you seem to be moving in a more coherent fashion. So I think we're back, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So I, I, I remember that uh, the Habib was reflecting on this hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu says, Allah marham khulafai, Allah show mercy upon my khulafa. And, this, and, 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 and then he was asked, who are your khulafa? He, he said, those who, who learn my hadiths and teach it to people, learn my tradition and teach it to people. And an interesting uh, thing that Habib highlighted, he, he had a deep, deep appreciation for language and a deep sense of understanding and showing you a different side of language as well. Even his use of language was very uh, unique. He said that, that, that the Prophet Sallallahu did not use the word khilafati, uh, i.e. as an institution. He used the word khulafa as individuals. And that's uh, khulafa uh, is, 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 is possibly the, the formula of plural itself indicates that, that there, there, there is no, it's jam'a taksir as you know. This is uh, this, uh, not av avoiding a jam'a mudhakkar salim for example, and actually there is no jam'a mudhakkar salim here, but to indicate that they will be individuals scattered and hidden. And looking for them will not be by uh, looking up a website or an organization and so on and so forth. And that they will, will not be functioning through a government. They will be functioning individually. And they will be functioning through very simple resources and means. Uh, but you will, you, will, you will recognize that through the fruit of the work, so through the, 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 the work that they do into, into the ummah. Um, he, I, I remember I asked Habib about uh, Brexit. That's, uh, that's uh, something I could share. And uh, he said to me, um, I, I said, what, what do you think? Uh, should, 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 we, should we vote for or against? And he said, none of the two parties is interested in supporting the Diana. It is all driven by economic uh, objectives. And it's all, it's something to do with, with uh, economy and maslaha and pragmatism. It's all pragmatic thing, nothing else. So, uh, but then he said, if you think that it will not harm you 
not to uh, sideline with any then bismillah you know and uh, and that that's part of the part of the of the of the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the one who's holding on to his deen is like someone who's holding on to brand of fire you know a brand of fire does not stay in your hand uh, cooling it down it's standing there burning it and we have this burning in burning desire to talk to give our public input in to, to give our input in public matters and to show that uh, we are fascinated with 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 alliances to make alliances and standing alone costs you a lot it costs you misjudgment because if you don't align with someone they will either accuse you of being arrogant or accuse you of being and then uh, accuse you of being with the other group and so on and so forth so it it is costly not to align but it is fulfilling it is costly not to align but it is prophetic it is difficult uh, but remember that at the end of times yakunu as'ad an-nas bi dunya luka ibn luka the happiest man in the world will be someone who has no uh, religion and has no uh, principles or any of that and remember that the, the loudest will be the ruaybda as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ar-rajul at-tafih yatakallam fi amr al-'amma so if we live at the time where the luckiest will be luka and the loudest will be ruaybda then those who hold their tongue and and and, and uh, they they disengage right and this 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 kind of like uh, this kind of like principle of this disenga- disengagement is not a negative or a passive one it is this engaging from a society where your voice will not be heard and where your impact will will not be uh, where your presence will not be impactful but focusing on your khwaisa focusing on the scope of where can you create a, a difference and the khwaisa of everyone varies if you are a family man then your khwaisa is your family if you are a scholar then your khwaisa is your students if you are someone so everyone works on their own khwaisa it's such a flexible concept that varies according to the status and you basically move from the public eye move from the public presence move from the the the, the all of these alliances and just serve people in a way that you believe is going to guide them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether they appreciate that or they don't they don't appreciate that so that was his line of thinking throughout uh, in yemen uh, he did not uh, even though he he went through a lot of injustice but he he, he never lied uh, like rode a, a wave of revolt or anything like that when he went to saudi arabia and he was criticizing certain practices in the society he was criticizing that in a, in the most beautiful and polite manner he was uh, talking about uh, even when he was talking about shia and salafia for example he would he would not attack shia and salafia he would talk as shia al al musanna like the fabricated shiism uh, and, and 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 he would talking about shia al mutatarrifa the radical shiism and he would talk about the salafia that uh, salafia al muqanna is the kind of the masked salafism <laughs> so someone who puts a mask of salafism but in fact it is modernism right one of the amazing things uh, that 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 i i i uh, of, of many things that i have found habib to be very uh, uh, creative about is he talked about the the uh, the revocation of language he said that al gharb yuhibbu naqd al lugha that uh, the, the, the west loves to revoke language and until i came across a book called uh, plastic words which talks about how modern language is dominated by 100 words essentially 100 words which are all uh, empty they have no meaning like the word system the word development the word sexuality the word identity which did not exist until 19 uh, 1930 it entered into into encyclopedias only in 1930 before that identity was identification it was to do with criminality taking fingerprints but identity as a as a concept did not exist un- until 1930 because there was a traditional idea of 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 the holistic uh, unity of human beings body body heart and soul right and and that that changed uh, with with the ideas of john locke and and other modernist philosophers and so on and so forth and now breaking that down to say well my identity is not me uh, can i use this pronoun or can can i not use this pronoun this whole idea of revoking language is something that have you ever talked about ages ago and uh, i found catholic uh educationists and philosophers to be saying the same thing and i am sure that habib did not read that <laughs> i am sure he did not see that and i was always 
uh, inspired to think, like, how did he, how did he formulate this idea? Habib did not speak a, a, a foreign language. How did he formulate this idea? That's that's something that's very, 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 very significant. His uh, ideas of uh, the decline of of politics in the in the post caliphate Muslim world, and that was technically an engagement with the nation state, uh, which is which uh, which he he basically highlighted the problems with it that it divides Muslims, and it 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 breaks their identities, and it. Uh, it 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 provides what what he calls al the polit the political ceiling the political institution that governs the change in the huwiya of the ummah in the in the in the in the whole face of the ummah that's administration that's uh, administrations ministries uh, governors and uh, policies and education system something that you can find for example someone like Wa'il Halak talking about how how the modern state introduced the concept of prison, the concept of education, and health. And these three institutions together are there to transfer the, the, the individual, the citizen, into a subject. So we're not talking about the modern citizen. We're talking about, about the modern subject. Habib talks about that. And that's, that's quite interesting because that's an engagement with politics, right? That's engagement with politics. That's engagement with what people call politics, but without making an alliance without sidelining with one idea, with one party against another party, right? Uh, I remember he, he wrote an article. I, I hope that people can have a, can, can, can see that it's in a, in, in a series called Al-Marsad al-Nabawi. He has Al-Marsad al-Nabawi 1 and 2 and 3, uh, he, where he commented on the, the, the Arab Spring. And in, the, in Egypt specifically, there, was a, there were two groups, one who was uh, kind of glorifying uh, themselves and demonizing others, and others were demonizing the, the, their opponent. So the revolutionists, they were uh, quoting or uh, invoking the example of Imam al-Hussein, alayhi salam. He was saying, look, uh, we are on the footsteps of, uh, of Imam al-Hussein. And then the other group were calling the, revol the revolutionists khawarij, as you know. And he actually uh, wrote an article called the Arab Spring, Al Arabi Al Arabi, Baina Al Jahl al Murakab Wal Fiqh al Mu'allab, between the compound ignorance and the prepackaged fiqh. Basically, you're making fiqh into a into into a new package to serve a specific institution, and then after that, all of that will be thrown away. Uh, I remember he got invitation to visit a specific country uh, by the government of that country, and he refused. And he said, "I cannot accept that invitation because uh, my country is being attacked by that uh, by that country. That's that's unacceptable." Then, then finally, what what would be the outcome of all of this? If you look, you will find that Habib's uh, after his his death and throughout his life, he was loved by people who are at odds with each other. You will find that the, all the like the Zaydis in Yemen, the Houthis in Yemen. The, 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 the government in Yemen, these were parties that are fighting with each other, that are colliding with each other at political odds with one another. But each one of them wrote in praise and in uh, wrote an obituary and wrote uh, pr uh, like a praise of Habib that he was a man who wanted to combine the ummah, who wanted to bring the ummah together, who wanted to ask people to, look, you can have your differences with one another, but there is something called Al Qawasim Al Mushtarak. His famous two words, Salamatul Lisan Min Adam or Salamatul Yad Min Adam, that the hand has to be safe from blood and the tongue has to be safe from uh, disparagement. These were essential things that I am sure will not be pleasing to politicians. I mean, not all politicians, but politicians with partisan agendas because they feed on that uh, partisanism, they feed on that sectarianism. Certain people have to can only survive when there is fight but habib did not did, did not want any anything anything like that and one final note uh, i remember when after the the the, the uh, conference in chechnya he actually issued a statement and he said whoever has participated in that in that uh, in that conference from the baalawi school they represent themselves they either represent their uh, educational institutions or uh, I specifically, I remember those words. He, they represent their uh, educational institutions or research organizations 
or uh, or da'wa organizations, but they do not represent the tariqa of al sada Ba'alawi because these are the people of Namat al awsat these are the people of the middle path, Sada to Sulh, these are the people of reconciliation, Baqiyya to Dam, these are the people who remained after the, the bloodshed. They broke Imam al Muhajir il Allah, he broke the, the soul and he decided to live a life. We are disinterested, we are disinterested in, in, in fighting for political positions. So he lived by that and he died at that. Yes, he might not have found his way too much into uh, mainstream media, but definitely people are, 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 are uh, realizing uh, how he was and, and what, what he lived up for. Subhanallah, Sheikh. I'm every. I I feel like you could just carry on for the next half an hour, or an hour, two hours. Just every word is just so insightful. It's absolutely remarkable. This final point you touched on, this idea of he said this is not the way of the Baalis. One of the things that blew my mind about him is when I remember with Shaawliullah, he meets the Baalis. He mentions in the Lamaat somewhere, and he says these are people of Ghazali. These are people who live by the way of Imam Al Ghazali, and they study his text, and they have their imams. And when I, when I think about the Habib, you know, Abu Bakr al-Adani, he is the Ghazalian in its in its true reflection. When I was reading about, like, Imam al-Subki talks about Izzah ibn Abdul Salam, about speaking truth to power, being principled. The Habib himself talks about the way of Imam al-Hassan, of sulh, bringing people together, reconciliation, the way of Imam al-Hussein, to, to sacrifice for the sake of your principles. Every single moment of that, what you said for the last 10, 15 minutes, for me, is a reflection of the Habib that he took that tradition, what he inherited so seriously. And he, he didn't care what happened. He didn't, you know, murra. speak the truth, even if it's bitter. And, and he was willing to do that. And I just find this is such a remarkable individual, such one of the things I read, and I've just started reading him in the last few weeks. You know, he mentions this thing about the one, just such a beautiful point. He mentions, I think about the Mahdi. And he says there will be confusion and disruption and chaos until the Mahdi arrives. And he says, but the Mahdi will come upon a somewhat united Ummah. And so he says, in like a, it's a form of reflection. And he says, so therefore, it's like in a sense, he's saying, we have to invite the Mahdi. That it is his time now to arrive. So we have to bring, like we have to bring, you know, one of the things the Ottomans used to say, I've read, I have quite a few books on the Manaqib. You know, the ulama used to write about the Ottoman state, the, the, the virtues of the Ottoman Khilafah. They would always say, the, the, the Khulafa of the Uthmaniyun, the Khulafa of the Ottomans, their job is to preserve the Khilafa. They will protect the Khilafa. They will preserve that fortress until the Mahdi comes. And then they will take it in their hands and they will give it to him as a gift. And I feel like the Habib, even though the Khilafa no longer is there, he's saying, you have a gift. Develop your gift for once and then give it to the Mahdi when he comes. Invite him so that... Subhanallah, I'm just absolutely blown away, really. And I'm I know because we're already with so much time has gone and and, and I don't want to I know that that Shah Masad has a very important in, engagement that he has to go to uh, inshallah. So I don't want to keep um, anybody for too long as well. And I and I'm thinking maybe we could start bringing things to a close. But everything you said there was just so absolutely remarkable. My hope is that we can invite both of you back to to continue this conversation on each of your areas of expertise, inshallah ta'ala. I mean, I, I'm hoping we have enough time before we make the dua. I was just hoping maybe if I could just ask both of you just to give some reflections on, you know, final reflections on your, the Habib, rahimahullah ta'ala, what he means to us, how we as Muslims living, you know, you talked about, I think Ustad Adam talked about this idea that the Muslims of the West, we are in the midst of the fitan. We are living it every single day. It's just non-stop, one thing after another. Just the fitna are just compounding upon us. What what can we take from the advice of the Habib? What advice can we take from his life um, that we can operationalize ourselves now in this in this time of, of intense tribulation, inshallah ta'ala. So maybe if I ask Ustad Adam to, to start this one and then Shaykh Ahmad Masad, inshallah. I uh, I was just blown away by Sheikh Ahmed's insights as well, and it brings back so many so many fond memories. Uh, and and I think any, anybody who who had spent time with Habib Abu Bakr upon hearing of his passing, it was a very very numb feeling. So it wasn't even necessarily a, a negative feeling, uh, but it was just uh, I think mainly sadness sadness that 
Habib has passed and there are so many people who haven't had the chance to take from him. But Alhamdulillah, when we reflect upon the Messenger وسلم, when he said, my life is good for you and my death is good for you, then also uh, with Habib Abu Bakr, because of the, 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 the sheer amounts of gifts and gems and tools and shields and, and weapons that he's left behind for us, Alhamdulillah, we, we still have this opportunity, whether you met him or whether you didn't meet him, you have this opportunity. And we were, we were talking a lot about the West and, and as did Habib Abu Bakr. And so one, uh, several times, several times over the years, I said, uh, Habib, can we arrange a visit for you to, to the West and we'll make all the arrangements, we'll make sure it goes smoothly, we'll set up some courses where you can teach fiqh tahawalat and you can teach... And he used to say, he was very, very straightforward. He is not coming to England. And even when he went to France for his uh, medication, he made it clear that the only reason that he went to France was for those specific tests and that medication. Otherwise, he didn't see that he had any business uh, visiting the West. However, he did. He, he, he said in response, what, what, what you can do is bring people from the West here to Yemen to study in these colleges and take this knowledge and so that invitation is still open to everybody and one of the, one, one of the you know we're talking about common themes as sheikh ahmed said he was somebody who understood the power of words very very he knew the power of words and one of the things he would always emphasize over the years and and with this we have a takeaway for everybody who's watching uh, this evening you you can go away with something inshallah uh, with one of these gifts from habib abu bakr what he used to do is he used to take proverbs and sayings which have become part of the mainstream norm and culture and understanding and narratives and he would correct them. So, for example, one of the main ones he used to mention often was uh, there's a saying in Arabic, I think it's it's originally a French uh, proverb, al salim fil jasad al salim, that a sound mind and a sound body. This is a saying, even in English, they say a sound mind and a sound body. He said, no, this is not correct. He said, when you see wrestlers, you know, like these MMA, MMA fighters, mixed mark, when they, they, they have sound bodies, but they're punching each other and kicking each other and bruising each other and swelling up and damaging. So he says, where's the sound mind in this sound body? Their bodies are the strongest and the fittest of bodies. But it's, it's an incorrect to say that you have a sound mind in a sound body. He said, rather, it should be a sound mind in a sound heart. And this is what he pushed people towards. And then another saying, which he corrected as well, which is a very, very popular saying, you know, this, this saying that uh, ends, uh, sorry, means are justified by the ends. Uh, what, what is it? <laughs> sorry, have I, have I got that the right way? The, 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 the means are the means. justified the by ends. the ends. And, and the ends says, the no, means. no, it's, it's the, exactly. It, no, it's the means, actually, which justify the ends. And so we have these proverbs, we have these sayings, and one which I thought of, is, you know the saying, ignorance is bliss. It's not. Knowledge is bliss. And, you know, there are many proverbs which, which were fed from a very young age, which are kind of accepted as maxims, as, as truths. And they're not. And Habib Bakr would be talking about Tajdeed Lughat al-Islam, the renewal of the Islamic language or the Islamic narrative. And we, we have to make sure that... that uh, we're, we're, Inshallah, so here's the take. I don't want to get too deep into it. Here's the takeaway for everybody today, inshallah. Go away, look at the proverbs, what you've been brought up to, 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 to memorize and to repeat and to accept and change them and correct them and put them back out there into, into society. Uh, what one of the most powerful things which I ever heard Habib Abu Bakr say, and bear in mind, Masjid al Aydarus in Aden, like what Sheikh Ahmed was saying, is one of these unique places which actually the Musalleen. The people, the congregation in this masjid, they're very unique, mashallah. You'll find Salafis praying in there. You'll find Islah, who are the Ikhwanis praying in there. You'll find the Sufis in there. You'll find, yani, mashallah, tabarakallah. And so he practiced what he preached. And one of the most powerful things which I ever heard him say, he said, this Islam is pure. It's like pure water. But what we do is we put it in bottles. And then we put a label around it. And we call it this brand and that brand, you know, Volvic, Evian. Uh, Highland Spring and then we've even got the audacity to put an expiry date on it on the end of it 
he, he said, Islam is pure. It's pure water. And many of these labels which people give themselves, whether it's Sufi, whether it's Salafi, whether it's Ikhwani, whether it's Shi'i, whatever these labels are, you're not even true to this claim which you're making. Subhanallah. Like, how true are the Salafis to the Salaf of Salah? How true are the Sufis to the to the, 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 the concept of Tasawwuf, science of Tasawwuf? How true are the Ikhwanis to brotherhood, Islamic brotherhood? <laughs> How true are the Shia to the people of Imam Ali? You know, the list goes on and on and on. And so Habib Abu Bakr, whenever he saw that a label, which is basically just a sticker, which you can put on anything, when that prevents you from progressing, then leave it to one side. You don't have to go down there. Now, I remember a, a, an interaction once between Habib Abu Bakr and uh, a Salafi. And Habib Abu Bakr was making dua for the Salafi. And he got all the way to the end of the dua in which it's the norm for him to say, Wa ila hadrat al-Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Fatiha. And he didn't say it. He said, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. And he finished his dua in a different way because that in itself, even though it's good, and even though he can justify, it could potentially be a barrier between him and between this person. And it's just the, the hikmah in the tasarraf. And, and one thing which you always saw is the, the reason and the way that Habib Abu Bakr would be, what, the reason why he was loved within certain people within the Salafi circles and was loved by certain people in the Ikhwani circles and all these different groups. The reason is because they believed that he was genuine and he was genuinely concerned for them and he was and so sometimes it's good to take a step back and forget about you know this fighting what we have to focus to focus on the unity as you rightly said sheikh uh, yani the I I imam al mahdi is going to be representing all of the muslims and there has to be something which unites us before that happens and Habib Abu Bakr was somebody who, through a living example, showed us how to build bridges and come closer. Not, not all become the same, because that might not necessarily happen as easy, but at least put aside many of our differences when those differences are impeding the ability for, for us, us to come together. Alhamdulillah, we have in uh, Habib Abu Bakr uh, somebody who, who renewed the prophetic inheritance in a way that it's digestible for us just in the time that we, we, we are in need of this inheritance. Uh, just one final example, and, and I'll leave it at there. He once sat us down and he said, uh, do, do you know the meanings of ha mean? Do you know the meanings of ain sin qaf? Do you know the meanings of alif la meme, alif la ra? Is it agreed upon what these mean? And we just kept quiet. And he said, the meanings of these will be revealed in the future. They'll be revealed in the future. These and the meanings of them, the power of them will be stronger than nuclear weapons. So any nuclear weapons which are thrown at you, these openings of the surahs in the Quran, these will be more powerful than them. But it just goes to show that there are there are uh, gifts which have been left by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for people in, in his ummah, which weren't necessarily for the times which have gone, but are for the times which we're coming towards and which which are, are upon us, basically. And Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani did a huge service to the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in raising awareness of these tools and these gifts and also making them accessible to us in a way which will benefit us, inshallah, going forward. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, Sheikh Ahmed's uh, uh, Du'as as well All, uh, if, if you understood If you understood the service What Habib Abu Bakr has done Not just for us as individuals For the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu We might not realize it in this generation Then the next generation will realize it The next generation will know about Habib Abu Bakr And what he's done for the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Um, and and now, Jazakallah Khair so much to Ustad Adam. It's been incredible just this whole event and your interactions and your and your reflections and Subhanallah. And I want to ask, and I'm going to ask Ahmed Saad to to make the final du'a as well, Inshallah Taala. But before you do, Sheikh Ahmed, I was hoping that 
you know, I, you mentioned Wael Halaq. You see, I love Wael Halaq. I mean, I, I listen to him. I read him. He's an incredible scholar. Allah Island, whether he's Muslim or not, if he's not Muslim, Allah bring him to Islam. Um, but he... And then you mentioned this idea of the language, and that's halak. That's you know he doesn't like any word. Society is problematic. Saying the citizen is problematic. Colonial. He hates the nation state. And then you mentioned the Habib knew this and mentioned this, and it's one of the incredible things about our tradition sometimes that we get very complacent and this inferiority complex that we're just bamboozled by people with degrees and PhDs, and then these these immense people from our tradition are saying the same thing in a much more powerful and profound way and you mentioned that and the second reflection i took from what you said you had the khuaisa i think that mantra that you put forward about it's not about this big global outreach it's not about sometimes the greatest engagement is to disengage subhanallah i felt that's us as an organization the karima foundation here we are in high wickham it's all about grassroots it's all about teaching the people it's all about you know social work it's all about making sure the kids have a jujitsu and all of this sort of thing that we're trying to do is it was like we're fulfilling the habib's mandate without ever having met him and inshallah allah ta'ala will allow us to meet him one day inshallah ta'ala in, in a good place so i was just hoping the shah masad before you close for dua and we ask the munshid to sing after if you could just give us your final reflections and advices that you've taken from your incredible study of the Habib, inshallah ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Jazakallah khair. I remember that, uh, that Habib, when he used to talk about the, uh, the Ta'if al-Mansura, the, the kind of this, the, the victorious group, and he used to say that that is not a, a group, a specific group in a specific geographical location. These are individuals who are scattered across the globe they believe the same thing they unify their hearts are unified they, they don't come under one slogan but their hearts are unified and they have that perspective that when the time comes they will be all supporting that cause because this is what they have believed in and i wanted to finish as a as a reflection on this with one of the poems of habib uh, of course he has a, a lot of poems that he uh, that he, he, he used to kind of put in these beautiful pictures and put out there. And he has a diwan called al Mawrid al Azb, which is beautiful. It's, um, uh, it's still under editing, but there is a PDF. Possibly I'll be able to share the PDF. It's very, very beautiful. Um, but this, uh, this poem specifically uh, uh, is special to me because I wrote a takhmis on it. I wrote like three, three half hemistitches on it. And I sent it to Habib and he, he kind of liked that and it represents his life. Uh, so his words uh, go like that. Um, and uh, he says, Ana namlatun mutafa'ila, wa bihimmati mutafa'ila. I'm an active ant and I have hope, so, so much hope with my ambition. Don't you see my, my power? I have a, a wholesome personality. I have sworn that I will not uh, bow down. I will keep patiently carrying the load that I'm carrying. For our worries and concerns are like a trunk on our back now. It's seek, the secrets that, uh, that has made, made it in such a way are so many. And patience shows, brings about the fruit that you can see. And people are just uh, uh, completely unaware of that. People are fighting. They keep fighting uh, and, and uh, while they are on the verge of, of a, a calamity. They're falling. They're fighting over something and they, they will lose it. Uh, he says, I wish that the, the minds of people would understand the secret of this life, the temporariness of this life, the sojournness of this life, and uh, the reason why I actually wrote and I, I didn't I, I didn't read my 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 tahmis on that, but the reason why I mentioned uh, this qasida is because Habib, uh, to me, he is representing this namla, or this namla represents him, that ant that was storing for the for the winter. Uh, even though it might not live to witness that winter. And it was always active and engaging, despite the fact that there might be other, uh, 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 other, other creatures that are fighting here and there. And uh, he, he, he was like that. 
the, that kind of uh, if we if we always say that the believer is like a, a bee, he collects the the nectar from flowers. Uh, but what if there is no flowers? Uh, the, if we say that the, the, the believer is like a bee, um, that's in good times. But he should be an ant in difficult times because he should be saving for uh, the time when it is very stressful. He should be saving his power and working diligently, uh, regardless of whether people know them or not. <laughs> and I remember when we were in primary school, they used to teach us the Qasida of uh, Ahmad Shawqi, كانت النملة تمشي مرة تحت المقطم فارتخى مفصلها من هولة الطود المعظم that there was an ant one day walking below the mountain and it got scared by the hugeness of the mountain while it's consumed in that uh, bewilderment it fell in a little pool of water and that little pool of water is so small but for the ants وهي عند النمل كاليم it is like an ocean for the, for the ants so what Habib was doing, if you if you compare his qasida, his poem about the, the ant, and Ahmad Shawqi's qasida about the ant, he is telling us that the ant should not be bothered about the hugeness of the mountains, the mountains of evil that we are seeing today, the waves of, of doubt and, and, and misconceptions and attacks and all of that, because the more we be, pay attention to them in this scary way, the, 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 the easier we will fall into them. We will fall into, we won't be able to see the dangers beneath our feet. But to be actively engaged and to be actively focused, uh, not on what is going to save us now, but what is going to be in the future. Just store regardless and work uh, regardless. And this is exactly what he did. He did not busy himself with uh, if people are going to see uh, my work and appreciate it or not he would just uh, he was just continuously writing and uh, I, I will I'll conclude with, with one last thing uh, to show that this man was always giving hope and he had always a unique perspective my wife is left-handed and she always uh, uh, felt a little bit uh, like proud of that sometimes that um, that uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad is left-handed there's like she used to count a few people like Hamza Yusuf and others left-handed and I remember in one of the visits to Habib, I said to him, Habib, you know, uh, my wife is left-handed and she was inquiring if you uh, if, uh, if that's uh, if you have anything to say about that. And he said to me uh, that, he, that he is left-handed. Habib was left-handed, by the way. So he said, uh, when I came to Habib Abdul Qadir al-Saqaf, uh, some people said to him, Ya Habib, waladak hadha a'sar. Like this son of yours writes with his left hand. He said Sayyidina Umar ta'ala anhu was left-handed. And he kind of narrated uh, this, this, this narration that Sayyidina Umar anhu is left-handed by a chain of some of the habayib who are actually left-handed. And I said to Habib, Khalas qabilna al-ijaza, we'll take this ijaza uh, and I'll take that back as a, as a glad tiding to my wife. So it is, it is this change of perspective that has made Habib stand alone in the middle of the other habayib. And there was so much attack. Uh, we, we, possibly, we didn't have the chance to, to talk about this, but there was actually so much criticism of fiqh al-tahawalat amongst the habayib. Uh, I was in Tanzania back in May, and I met one of the manasib uh, there, and he, he just like dismissingly uh, said, oh, Abu Bakr al-Adani is talking about this fiqh al-tahawalat. I don't know where did he get this idea from. But people didn't bother writing properly even a, a, a risala or a small book to discredit fiqh al-tahawalat and they just dismissed it without even delving into it. Some of the Habayib who were at odds with, with the Habib, but Habib would still welcome all of them and would, would embrace all of them and he would deal with them. In, I have not heard him criticizing or talking ill of anyone, whether from the school or outside the school. So this is this is a, the spirit of the, of the ant, being engaged, focused, uh, don't be distracted from the long-term purpose that, that, that the one has and don't listen to that don't listen to the, those who want to discredit the work that you're doing as long as you are on the bayina on the on the right way inshallah inshallah jazakallah khair sheikh just before you make the dua i just want to make mention to the fact that i am also left-handed so now that <laughs> i you know qabil to ijaza i take this ijaza as well that has validated my left-handedness alhamdulillah I, I have I am in the as well. my youngest daughter khadija She's left-handed, so mashallah, it's a, it's a blessing, alhamdulillah.
We are all in glorious company, alhamdulillah. If I could ask uh, Sheikh Masad before um, the Munshid closes us off with the rest. Inshallah, we take the barakah of his dua. Subhanallah. This is always the problem with Mashaikh. Nobody, the dua is just past the parcel. <laughs> Uh, Sheikh Adam, you're muted. Maybe that's a sign that. <laughs> yeah, we're very <laughs> lucky that I'm not a Sheikh, and and the Sheikh is 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 there who can make the dua, inshallah. I mean, Sheikh Masad, please, inshallah. في الظهور والبطون عدد ما كان وعدد ما يكون على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. اللهم يا أرحم الراحمين يا أول الأولين يا آخر الآخرين يا رحم الضعفاء والمساكين. اللهم كما نقلت السر عنا. لا تخ... لا تخلنا من السر يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم لا تخل هذه الأمة من السر ومن اهل السر ومن الوراث الحقيقيين لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافنا واعف عنا وهيئنا لكل خير ادفع عنا كل سوء وضر اللهم ارحم شيخنا الحبيب ابو بكر المشهور واعلي درجته في علي والحقنا به غير ضالين ولا مضلين ولا فاتنين ولا مفتونين وعن طريقه غير متحولين يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم ارزقنا حسن البر به في الدنيا والآخرة واجمعنا به وبنبيك صلى الله عليه وسلم في جنات الخلد اللهم اشف أمراضنا ونق أغراضنا واصلح أحوالنا ونور بواطننا وظواهرنا واجعل أعمالنا وأعمارنا وأيامنا وأقوالنا وأحوالنا كلها في طاعتك يا رب العالمين اللهم إنا نسألك أن تخلف فيه تخلفنا فيه خيرا يا رحم الراحمين اللهم صل قلوبنا بك واجمعنا بك عليك وهدنا منك إليك ويسر لنا الطريق إليك وبارك في إخواننا هؤلاء وفي جهورهم وفي من يقف من خلفهم واجعلنا وإياه من عبادك الصالحين المقبولين وإلى حضرة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة I just want to finish today's majlis, this gathering, this, you know, the, in the mention of the pious barakah descends and we pray that Allah Ta'ala through this gathering showers his blessings upon us and our communities, uh, our community in High Wycombe and, and, and the communities of both of the, the shuyukh in Liverpool. May Allah Ta'ala bless Liverpool especially. I mean, they're not doing too great in the league. But anyways, may Allah Ta'ala bless, bless Sheikh Ahmed Saad and his community as well. And we are in High Wycombe, so we're hoping that one day, inshallah, Sheikh Ahmed Saad, I think you're in London, so we can host you at some point. Sheikh Ahmed Saad, for those people, um, he's uh, he's got his own institute. You can follow him. He's got a Telegram channel, which I follow quite um, consistently and you can follow his uh, updates on that. He's also done some work for Hamim Foundation, I think, on ideas of modernity and things. And so I think if you want further elaboration on the work, you just type him into YouTube, inshallah, and he's got a few lectures and things and a, and a six, hours, six hour course, I think, on Seeker's Guidance where he taught the signs of the end of times. So if people want to uh, get in touch with him, inshallah ta'ala, you can do that through various channels. And I'll start Adam Kelwick. I don't know if there's any way that people can contact you if they want to. Do you have a YouTube or... Facebook, yeah, I know you're on Social Facebook, media. so maybe yeah, I know you're on Facebook, media. so maybe people. Facebook. Okay, just generally you can reach out to us, Father Adam. And I just want to extend my own gratitude to both of you. Jazakallah khair for coming, for, for uh, blessing us with your presence. And forgive me if there were any moments in which I was uh, not discourteous to either of you uh, and make dua for me and make dua for our community. And hopefully, inshallah, bless us with your presence. One final thing, I mean... For me, until he passed away and I started reading his books, Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani was always in my head the Habib who sings Ya Ali Masirri Minna when you Google it on YouTube. That's all I had. Because I used to YouTube to find, because in my favorite Qasida of Imam al-Haddad, so I used to type in Ya Ali Masirri Minna, I used to say, oh, Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani, he's the one who sings that. And I just thought he was the Habib Munshid. But I didn't know he was this mountain of knowledge. And so just, I don't know, I am hope we have a Munshid with us, inshallah. Ustad Asim, are you there? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, I'm here. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So, just to take us to a close, a final dua from one of the ancestors of the Habib, Imam uh, Abdullah bin Alawi al Haddad, and his famous poem, Ya Alim al Minna, to take us to a close to, in today's gathering, inshallah ta'ala. Ya Alim al Minna, la tahtika sitra anna wa afina wa afu anna wa kunna haythu kunna Ya Rabbi ya Alim al-Hal ilayka wajahtu al-Amal 
فمن علينا بالإقبال وكلنا واصلح البال يا ربي يا رب الأرباب عبدك فقيرك على الباب أتى وقعد بات الأسباب مستدركا بعد ما مال يا علي ما سري منا لا تهتك ستر عنا الله وعافنا واعفو عنا وكلنا حيث كنا يا واسع الجود جودك الخير خيرك وعندك فوق الذي رمى عبدك فادرك برحمتك فيه الحال يا موجد الخلق طورا وموسع الكل برا أسألك إسبال سترا على الطبائح والأخطال يا علي ما سري منا لا تهتك سترا عنا وعافنا وافو عنا وكلنا حيث كنا يا من يرى سر قلبي حسب الطلاء كحسبي فامحو بعفوك ذنبي واصلح قصودي والأعمال ربي عليك اعتمادي كما إليك استنادي صدقا وأقصى المرادي رضاؤك دائم الحال الله 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 يا ربي يا ربي إني أسألك العفو عني ولم يخب فيك ظني يا مالك الملك يا وال أشكو إليك وأبكي من شؤم ظلمي وإفكي وسوء فعلي وتركي وشحوة القيل والقال الله 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 وحب دنيا ذميما من كل خير عقيما فيها البلا يا مقيما وحش وحافات واشغال يا ويح نفس الغوية عن السبيل السوية أضحت روج عليا وقصد حالجه والمال الله 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 فأنت مولى الموالي المنفرد بالكمال وبالعلا وتعالي على التعمبر بالأمثال جودك وفضلك وبيرك يرجى وباطشك وقحرك يخشى وذكرك وشكرك لازم وحمدك والإجلال الله 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 وصلي في كل حالا على مزيل الضلالا من كلمات حل غزالا 
محمد الحادي الإدال والحمد لله شكرا على نعم منه تترى نحمده سيرا وجحرا وبالغداء والأصال الله 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 يا علي ما سري منا لا تهتك ستر عنا وعافنا واعف عنا وكلنا حيث كنا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم Jazakallah khair to our brother Asim for that beautiful rendition and our teacher Sheikh Ahmad Saad for sending some of the pictures. I think those are his own personal photos of the Sheikh. We ask Allah Ta'ala one more time, one final time in this gathering to send abundant blessings upon the grave of the teacher of our teachers, Habib Abu Bakr al-Adani, make his grave a garden from the gardens of paradise and reunite us with him in Iliyin and in Jannatul Firdaus and at the hawd of Sayyidina Muhammad, his grandfather, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam For those of who benefited from this Inshallah, please do share the link Please do uh, encourage people Subscribe to the Karima YouTube channel And Inshallah there will be a lot more like this In remembrance of the Mashaykh Who have passed And Inshallah Ta'ala make dua for us and, and and our work And we pray that Allah Ta'ala blesses the efforts Of every single Muslim And we ask Allah to have mercy upon the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam This is the dua I heard Habib make Oh Allah have mercy upon the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Wherever they may be, however they may be So we ask Allah to have mercy upon the Ummah Of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Once again gratitude to my guests And Inshallah we'll see you again soon Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh